The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Jason Lank live in studio. We have a very nice show lined up for you today. In just a moment, we'll be joined by Heidi Richardson, global investment strategist at BlackRock. Uh, of course, BlackRock offers the iShares ETFs. So iShares is the largest ETF provider in the world. And we're going to spend the bulk of our discussion with Heidi talking about the stronger dollar in what it means for your investments. If you've been following our show over the past year or so, you know that currencies have been a big theme. We've talked a lot about the impact of a rising dollar on both U.S. and international stocks, not to mention other investments like commodities. And certainly, we think most investors should own both U.S. and international stocks in their portfolios. So a rising dollar is something we think you should pay at least some attention to and be aware of how it might impact your returns. Jason, interestingly, we know that more and more investors are paying attention to this, especially ETF investors. And we know that by looking at where investors have been placing their hard-earned dollars, as it turns out, more than $20 billion flowed into currency-hedged ETFs in the first quarter of the year. Now, these are ETFs that invest in international stocks, but remove the currency risk involved with doing so. And again, we're going to visit with Heidi Richardson from BlackRock here in just a moment, and we'll talk about this. But Jason, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, shoot, even two years ago, currencies really weren't even on the radar for most investors. They, they really haven't been until lately. And I, I should clarify, you say 20 billion. If you're mathematically challenged, a billion is a thousand million dollars. So there's quite a bit flowing in. That's the first quarter. That's not a decade. That's the first quarter. Of course, billions last year as well. You know, I've been in this business a long, long time. And, and you're right in that, you know, in the 90s and even 2000s, we just didn't talk about currencies. It just wasn't front and center. But of course, we've seen, you know, the various monetary actions around the around the world by the various central banks have really created some interesting situations. And, and frankly, short term, in the, in the short term, currency moves can have a meaningful impact on your investment performance. Well, that's the bottom line. The bottom line is currencies as they've moved front and center with the U.S. dollar, more and more investors are looking for, uh, for ways to hedge that currency exposure in their portfolios. And certainly, iShares has responded with a number of currency hedged ETFs. So we're going to cover this from several different angles this morning. We'll talk to Heidi first about the impact a stronger dollar is having in three key areas, the U.S., Europe, and Japan. And then we'll examine currency hedged ETFs and whether you should consider using them in your portfolio now, later in the show, Jason, you and I are going to uh, continue with a currency theme, and we're going to have a little fun here. There's something called the Big Mac Index. This tells you how much a Big Mac costs in different countries, and it's sort of a fun way to compare currency values. Well, there's another survey that came out recently that takes this a step further. It includes iPhones and Levi jeans, even how much a cheap date costs in different countries. So we'll have some fun looking at that, and then we're going to close the show today with our usual ETF spotlight which will be on a currency-hedged iShares ETF. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can find us on Twitter, or you can email us at advice at etfstore.com. So let's just start this morning by visiting with Heidi Richardson. Again, Heidi is Global Investment Strategist at BlackRock. BlackRock offers the iShares ETFs. And we're very pleased to have Heidi joining us via phone from London this morning. Uh, Heidi, a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Thanks for having me, Nate. Well, Heidi, as Jason and I were just mentioning, one of the most pervasive themes in the financial markets right now is the strength of the U.S. dollar. And before we get into how this is impacting places like Europe and, and Japan and how it can impact investors, I thought it might be good to have you offer a quick 
primer on currencies. Can you help our listeners understand what are some of the basic drivers that can cause currencies to go up or down relative to one another? Uh, Sure. Well, if you think about what's going on with economic policy outside of the U.S., whether you look at the Bank of Japan or the European Central Bank or even the People's Bank of China, they're in an easing process, meaning that they're looking to decrease interest rates in their particular environment. And I think that that's important because if you look at the Fed, the the U.S. Fed, after years of zero interest rate environment, is looking to raise their interest rate. So if you consider where we stand today, just looking at the 10-year bonds, the U.S. 10-year is hovering around 2%. If you go over to Germany and Europe, it's about 0.15%. If you go over to Japan, it's about 0.30%. So although 2% doesn't seem very robust, it's considerably higher than these other regions. So people that, that are looking for that flight to safety and the flight to quality will continue to demand U.S. assets and U.S. treasuries helping to support the stronger dollar versus some of those currencies. Now, the dollar is up some 20% over the past year or so, and certainly differing central bank policies and and economic outlooks have clearly been the main drivers for the stronger dollar. Is is there any reason to expect this to reverse anytime soon? Uh, What's the iShares base case for the U.S. dollar? Sure. I think you're going to see further strengthening of the dollar um, overall in terms of the broad basket of currencies. But if you look at individual currencies, I think it's going to be very different. For instance, if you look at the, the Bank of Japan, they've been in their quantitative easing process with Shinzo Abe taking the lead a couple of years ago. So if you look at what's happened to the yen versus the U.S. dollar over the last couple of years, it's declined 50%. But if you look at how it's traded this year, it's actually been flat to positive, slightly positive for the year-to-date for 2015 after that big decline of of about 50%. If we look at the euro, we've seen a lot of decline against the euro this year. We've seen the euro is actually down about 12% versus the U.S. dollar. So I don't want to lump all currencies together. I think you have to look individually at where the regions that you're investing and how you want to treat that currency and what's happening with central bank policies there. Well, you mentioned Japan and Europe. Let's talk about how a stronger dollar impacts different markets around the world. And again, I, I do want to focus on the U.S., Europe, and Japan. But let's start with the U.S., There's a lot of concern right now that a stronger dollar is hurting the earnings of U.S. companies that depend on exports. Do you think this is a big enough concern that it could potentially derail the economic recovery we've seen and therefore ultimately impact U.S. stocks in a negative way? No, you know what, I don't think it will derail the, the U.S. recovery. If we look at what's happening with the employment market, the unemployment rate has come way down. The economic growth rate in the U.S. marketplace is likely to come in at about 25 to 2.75% this year. That's considerably stronger than the other developed economies of Japan and Europe. I think the U.S. is on the track to continue this economic growth. But some of these large multinationals, these big exporters, certainly it's hitting some of their profits. In fact, a company like Intel a couple of weeks ago announced that it was going to be an impact of about a billion dollars to their bottom line, to their earnings. So it will impact some of these large exporters, but overall, I don't think it's enough to derail the recovery in the U.S. marketplace. Well, what about the U.S. consumer? Can they actually benefit from a stronger dollar? Because obviously we import a lot of goods and a stronger dollar makes those goods less expensive. Could that help the consumer and therefore help the economy in a positive way? Yes, it can. It, it absolutely can. When you think about the goods and services that are imported for U.S. and U.S. Uh, consumers, it makes those those goods and services much cheaper. Um, if we think about some of these smaller companies as well, not these big exporting companies in the U.S. marketplace, but these smaller companies, they're getting even more competitive. They're much much less vulnerable to that volatility of the currency. Okay, one last question here before we move on to Europe and Japan. Is it possible, regardless of stock valuations, that a stronger dollar continues to attract foreign investors? Because, of course, foreign investors are looking for the best return, just like everyone else. So is it possible that a stronger dollar continues to attract foreign investors, and that helps to prop up U.S. stocks? Maybe we have sort of a positive feedback loop here. I do think that you can have that positive feedback loop with that. I mean, if you think of it particularly as not only looking at the stock market and and investing in those companies to benefit from the stock market growth in the U.S. marketplace, but also, as I mentioned, on the bond side of it, the fixed income marketplace, looking at the treasuries as the central bank policy is actually increasing rates in the U.S. later this year. Other central banks around the world are lowering interest rates, so it makes our bonds look much more favorable for investors. We're visiting with Heidi Richardson, Global Investment Strategist at BlackRock. 
Uh, Heidi, let's move on and talk about Europe now. We know the European Central Bank has ramped up stimulus, uh, and European stocks are off to a great start this year. The iShares MSCI EMU ETF, ticker EZU, is up about 9%. What's your take on Europe, and what impact has a stronger dollar had here? Yeah, well, I think it's been a boon to the exporters, particularly areas like Germany that are large exporting environments. So this lower currency has actually been great for them. It makes their goods and services much more competitive. Well, you know, you just mentioned the the Euro- European Monetary Union being up about 9 or 10 percent. That's actually in U.S. dollar terms. If you look at the stocks in those regions, the stocks are actually up 21 percent on a year-to-date basis. But the dollar rallied so strongly against the euro, it actually eroded about 11% of the return. So, you know, I wouldn't sneeze at a, a 10 or a 9 or 10% return in the euro marketplace, but if you actually took the ability to hedge that currency risk of the stronger dollar, you could have made twice that return. And Heidi, I know we're, we're moving very fast here this morning and covering a lot of ground, but, but lastly, before we do get to currency hedged ETFs, what about Japan? If we look at the iShares MSCI Japan ETF, ticker EWJ, it's up about 18% year-to-date, and certainly the Bank of Japan has been full pedal uh, to the metal on stimulus. What do you see over in Japan? Yeah, we've seen the opportunity in Japan for the last couple of years, but for the last couple of years we were advising our clients and investors to hedge the currency risk with all of the easing policies from the Bank of Japan. I don't think you're going to see that type of volatility in the currency this year, so I'm not as concerned with hedging out the risk in that, but I think the policies with Shinzo Abe and what they refer to as Abenomics, his monetary policy reform, his fiscal policy reform, and structural reform, I think there, there's lots of shareholder-friendly policies that are going on that that will likely continue the run in Japanese equities. Hi, good morning. This is Jason Lank. Before we move on to our ETF discussion, I'd like to squeeze in a quick question on emerging markets. And one of the interesting characteristics there is that corporations and nations will often borrow in dollar terms rather than their local currency. And I'm just curious, if you're a borrower and you borrow in a currency different than your own, perhaps the dollar, what, a currency, what, what do dollar moves up and down mean to you as you repay that debt? Well, you know, it depends which of the individual currencies. If you look at a broad index, like an emerging market index, uh, something like we have the EEM index, the MSCI Emerging Market Index, there's actually 23 different currencies represented with the 26 or 27 countries in that index. So the volatility, some are declining, some are, some are rallying, and it really offsets itself. It almost negates the currency effect out in many cases. In fact, the emerging market index is up about 12% this year, whether you have the, the hedged version or the unhedged version. So I think that, you know, while some, if you're going into individual, uh, individual countries in emerging markets, those that are running current account deficits are going to be very, very vulnerable. But those that are running current account surpluses, like China or South Korea, will be much less vulnerable to the policies. Again, we're visiting with BlackRock's Heidi Richardson. Uh, Heidi, let's now get to the investment application here. If an investor believes there are positive reasons to invest in places like Europe and Japan, but they also have concerns about a weaker euro and yen, of course, this is where currency hedging can come into play. Now, in the euro area, one of the ETFs iShares offers is the currency hedged MSCI EMU ETF, ticker H-E-Z-U. And then in Japan, there's the currency hedged MSCI Japan ETF, ticker H-E-W-J. Can you talk about how these ETFs work, just high level, and then maybe explain the thought process investors should go through when deciding whether to hedge their currency exposure? Sure. Well, if you think about it, as a U.S. dollar investor, if you want to have some exposure outside the U.S. marketplace in Europe or Japan, you're, you're essentially saying, I want to buy the stock because I think it's going to be a good investment and the stock will likely go up, right? That's the whole reason why you want to buy a stock is for the increase in return. But when you buy a stock outside of the U.S., you're literally taking your U.S. dollars and you're selling those to buy the foreign currency that the stock is denominated in. So it's a two-part transaction. So if you think the U.S. dollar is going to strengthen against the individual currency, you could have erosion from that currency return. So much like I said, the the Eurozone, uh, as you mentioned, EZU, that HEZU market was up over 20%, but yet the dollar rallied against the euro and eroded half of that. Um, so I think it's really important to think about what is the individual outlook on some of these currencies and then just determine whether you want to have some hedged exposure or if you want to have a full on unhedged currency exposure. Now, if you think about about what we do with the iShares ETFs, 
they're very, very large established country and regional funds that we have outside of the U.S. And so you've got the liquidity there. And then we just we put a hedged wrapper vehicle. It's some, some forward currency contracts on side of that to hedge out some of the currency risk and reduce that volatility. So you get the underlying of the of the original fund and liquidity of that original fund. Uh, Heidi, at our firm, we look, look to minimize investment costs for our customers. And, and this is a, a technical question, perhaps, but there must be some cost to hedging, you know, whether it's small or large. Is that cost variable related to interest rates? Is there ever a period of time when the cost of hedging would be prohibitive? Well, we do short-term futures contracts on the portfolio on the portfolios that we're managing. So it's a very low cost, and they continue to roll. Heidi, you know, I've seen arguments both for and against currency hedging. Some argue that having foreign currency exposure can actually add diversification to your portfolio. And then I've seen others argue that currencies are simply a source of risk and not worth any potential diversification benefits. I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this? Because obviously iShares offers products allowing you to both hedge and not hedge currency exposure. You know, it really comes down to the the amount of time that you're going to have the investment. Currency fluctuations are much greater over a shorter term period. Over a longer term period, say, you know, five to seven years, they generally wash themselves out. And so you don't see as much of an re- impact on return over a longer period of time. But those short term those short term rallies and those short term declines can be pretty significant. Just like I mentioned that the yen was down fifty percent in a two year period. You know, in the year Euros down 12% on a year-to-day period. But if we look over longer periods of time, they generally, they're self-correcting markets. Okay, we have just a couple minutes left here. And regardless of whether an investor hedges their currency exposure, there are clearly some benefits to investing internationally. And I know your colleague, Russ Kostrich, recently wrote a piece titled The Case for International Diversification, where he laid out three reasons to consider more international exposure. Uh, One, relative valuations. Two, the U.S.'s declining share of world GDP. And then three, the basic tenets of portfolio construction, uh, that you can generate better risk-adjusted returns by having some international exposure. I was hoping maybe you could add some color uh, to one or all of these points before we let you go here today. Yeah, sure. Well, if you think about the U.S. marketplace, you know, most of us have a home country bias, and, and that's true to any particular country. More of their assets are in their local local environment and their local stock market. So many investors here in the U.S. haven't had much. You know, the U.S. market just is entering into its seventh year of a bull market run. It's arguably getting expensive out there in the marketplace. So there was no real reason to look outside of the U.S. borders when the U.S. markets were doing so well. If we look at Europe, Japan, and even emerging markets, emerging markets this year have been the best performing asset class on the equity side. If we think about the exposure there, the U.S. market is actually one of the worst performing. It's still positive this year, but it's not doing nearly as well as some of these developed economies outside of the U.S. or the emerging markets. And if I think, if, if we think about having some diversification there, it really does reduce some of the volatility in a portfolio, but also potentially offers you increased returns. Well, Heidi, with that, uh, we'll have to leave it there. We greatly appreciate you joining us this morning. My pleasure. Have a great day. You too. That was Heidi Richardson, Global Investment Strategist at BlackRock. And if you're interested in learning more about the iShares Currency Hedge ETFs, you can do so by visiting iShares.com. And they even have a neat little currency impact calculator where you can play around with both local stock returns and then currency changes to see what your actual returns might look like if you're investing internationally. Again, that's at iShares.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a little fun with currencies. We're going to tell you which country has the most expensive Big Mac and which offers the cheapest iPhone. We'll do that right after the break. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837 or visit ETFstore.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. 
Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. There is a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at etfstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products in categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at GetRegal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K-10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. Go with Regal, distributing service and solutions since 1955. Love your job? We do at Accent. We're now hiring customer engagement specialists. Great team members, caring leaders, career advancement opportunities, helping our community. Those are just a few reasons why our employees love working at Accent and why you will too. We're seeking energetic, motivated individuals with a customer-focused attitude to answer inbound customer service calls. You'll receive paid training, good benefits, and a fun environment with room to grow. Apply at AccentOnline.com slash careers. Welcome back to the UPF Store Show. Nate Tracy and Jason Lank live in studio this morning. Hope you enjoyed our conversation with Black Rock's Heidi Richardson. Jason, I thought Heidi did a nice job of laying out how a stronger dollar impacts some key markets like Europe and Japan and some of the things you want to think about when deciding whether to hedge the currency exposure in your international stocks. I thought you had some great points there. Well, she really did. And talk about a bright individual. That 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 discussion was, was, was high level. Uh, a couple of things that she meant that I thought were interesting in terms of international investing. And really, we're on the same page with her when it comes to building portfolios for our clients. You know, she talked about valuation, that perhaps there are some better deals to be had overseas right now than there are in the United States with the run-up we've had in our stock market. Again, another point she made, the diversification aspect. You know, you when you diversify geographically, you potentially smooth out and potentially increase the rate of return on your portfolio. And I think thirdly, even though we've seen major currency moves uh, over the last 18 to 24 months and may continue to see some, over the long term, she mentioned that they're self-correcting. In a sense, it's a zero-sum game. So if your investing time frame is 20 years, you may or may not be interested in hedging right now. Yeah, that being said, there is a lot of debate in this area right now. Of course, I mentioned at the top of the show that a lot of dollars have flowed into these currency-hedged ETFs. And, of course, if you look at the returns of these ETFs over the past year or two, they've been quite frankly, unbelievable, especially compared to the unhedged version. But, you know, the debate, and this centers on the question that I asked Heidi, is that over the long run, perhaps not having that currency exposure can lower the volatility or risk in your portfolio. Uh, And then again, you'll have others who will argue that it, it does offer some diversification. So, you know, as she pointed out, over the long run, zero sum game. But you know, it is a, a difficult decision for investors to uh, to think through when you see the differential in returns, like we've seen over the past couple of years. Yeah, there's a little bit of academic debate there. You're right. Are you adding value, or are you adding no value? Or are you subtracting value from your portfolio? And then volatility. Are you adding volatility or subtracting volatility? And remember, we've talked about strong dollar today, and that's a, a pervasive theme. But the dollar can go the other way. 
and no one has a crystal ball. And so what uh, one ETF giveth, another may taketh away at some point in the future. Well, that's the key. You know, are you making a tactical decision or is there a, a longer term strategic reason why you're hedging currencies in your portfolio? In any event, I, I did think that was a great discussion with Heidi and, and certainly we can have her back on the show uh, at a future date. Now, while we were talking currencies today, I, I thought we might have a little fun as well because this can be a heavy topic. So for fun, I thought we might look at this annual survey that Deutsche Bank puts together where they compare the prices of goods and services in different countries. And you may recall that last year we highlighted something called the Big Mac Index. So the Economist magazine puts this together every year, and it shows how much it costs to purchase a McDonald's Big Mac in different countries around the world. And the idea here is to highlight the differences in currency valuations. It's based on something called purchasing power parity. And the bottom line is that if prices for the same goods and services in different countries are not equal, that might suggest the country's currency is either overvalued or undervalued. For example, last year, a Big Mac here in the U.S. cost $4.80. But that same Big Mac in Norway cost $7.76. And in Ukraine, it only costs $1.63. So theoretically, the Norwegian kroner is overvalued, and the Ukraine currency, the hryvnia, is undervalued. Well, anyways, Deutsche Bank put together a similar analysis, and they released this about a week ago, and they looked at a number of goods and services, including the iPhone 6, Levi jeans, and even how much a cheap date would cost. And Jason, I know you looked at this report as well. For the most part, you could clearly see the impact of a stronger U.S. dollar. Yeah, the, the theme is, is very, very clear. And Heidi alluded to this relative to the dollar. Europe and Japan have become cheaper over the last year or so based on the monetary policies of those respective governments. Interestingly enough, India is actually the cheapest, according to the study. And Australia, believe it or not, is the most expensive. I, it's also important to note that the United States is actually the cheapest developed country. So, you know, there's relativity here as well. So, you know, it's interesting that if you're an international traveler and you're flexible about where you're going, you might take a look at this because your dollar is is going to not spend a whole lot in Norway. But again, it, it, it uh, you can get a, a Big Mac for a buck fifty in Ukraine now. When as you're playing taxis on the runway, you may get bombed, <laughs> but it's a it's it's going to be a cheap a Big Mac. So you know in Norway again seven fifty. If you're going to visit the Golden Arches, you better bring a gold bar with you. So it's uh it, it's kind of an interesting thing that they, they, they yeah, point out. You know it, it was interesting because the cheapest place to buy an iPhone six is actually here in the U S. And then the most expensive place is Brazil at a price of one thousand two hundred and fifty four dollars. By the way, that's a a, a pricey iPhone. Now, the U.S. is also the third cheapest place to buy a nice pair of Levi 501s. Now, I'm sure there's some brand premium in other countries for these popular U.S. brands, so I'm not sure how much you can take from this. But I also looked at some of the other areas that Deutsche Bank surveyed. They actually put together a cheap date index. Uh, and Jason, this is a real cheap date. I would caution you on taking the uh, misses out on this one. It includes cab rides, McDonald's burgers, a couple of movie tickets, and two beers. Well, I, I guess you might enjoy that, uh, but I'm not so sure that Cindy would enjoy that. But uh, anyways, Mumbai in India was the cheapest place to go. And the most expensive, interestingly, was San Francisco and then Tokyo, Japan. Right. This is one report, Nate, you don't want your significant other to see at least the title of uh, what you've got in mind. But it is interesting how the, the, divide, divide, the, rather, the divergence here is. And we talk about India on this cheap date index. I mean, it's literally a quarter the cost of New York prices are, are in, in the dollar. So the trend here, I think, is the important key. We're seeing Berlin, Paris, London have fallen in 2014 and 2015 relative to the dollar. One point I would make, though, is that as the Deutsche Bank prepares this report, you know they compare it to New York prices. Now we're we're broadcasting live great point. from Kansas City, and I, and so our dollars spend a little better than they do in New York. And so I'm always I'm always impressed with my friends who move here or relocated from the East Coast to, to the Midwest. Their money spends great because the cost of living is so much higher. So if you live in small town USA, you know your cheap date index may be a whole lot different than what this report shows. So that's one of the things you want to keep in mind. Yeah, and again, you know, we're just trying to have a little fun here looking at a report like this. But but the key investment takeaway is, again, the trend here. And I, I do keep coming back to that because you can clearly see the impact of the stronger dollar uh, in different places. Uh, you know, Jason, if you look at that cheap date index in Europe, again, places like Berlin and, and, and Paris, 
it was significantly cheaper from uh, in 2015 than it was in 2014. So you could see the impact of the stronger U.S. dollar. One last note here. I mentioned that The Economist magazine put together the Big Mac Index, and that's still the most popular comparison like these, and I'm sure that's where Deutsche Bank got their inspiration for the survey. But Deutsche Bank also took the opportunity to poke a little fun at The Economist. They compared how much a subscription to The Economist magazine cost in different countries. Uh, it was actually most expensive in Switzerland, in cheapest uh, in Brazil, but I thought that was kind of funny. It is. It's a nice little jab. This report is actually very, very detailed, and it's it's a thirty or forty page report. They do a great job, but it uh, it, it is interesting to see around the world what divergent monetary policy can do to the ordinary things that we purchase every day. Well, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have a quick market update, and later we'll spotlight a currency hedged ETF. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN fifteen ten. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet Stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell brand of products anywhere in the United States. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st and State Line, 816-941-2221. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at ETFstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need J-Girl Media. J-Girl Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. J-Girl Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgirlmedia.com today. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International, 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. So stocks are now back at record highs. Last week, the S&P 500 closed up about 
1.75%. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up nearly 1.5%. And the NASDAQ was up 4.25% for the week. Uh, And Jason, most noteworthy here has to be the NASDAQ. Uh, After 15 years, the NASDAQ finally eclipsed its March of 2000 high. Uh, Does this make you feel good or, or bad? Well, 15 years. Uh, let's take a trip down memory lane because that's that's quite a while ago. Of course, that was the peak of the dot-com bubble. You know, the late 90s leading up to 2000, we saw anything internet-related, just stratospheric valuations. There, you know, there, were, there were companies with negative revenue and billion-dollar valuations. You know, I distinctly remember people day trading because everything went up. You, you bought your tech stock in the morning, you sold it in the afternoon, you took the proceeds and went to happy hour that night. And that went on for years. Well, we know what happened. And of course, you know, starting in 2000 into 2002, you know, a tremendous loss of value. Um, I do remember some of these tech companies with, you know, all of their marketing budget spent on one Super Bowl commercial. And you'll have to remind me, what was the company with the sock puppet? Well, I always think of pets.com. Yeah, right, right, right. So, you know, 15 years later, how do I feel? Um, you know, it's nice to be back to even. 15 years is a long period of time. And, you know, I might argue that that's, there's a lot of manipulation in there over the last six or seven years based on uh, interest rates. Um, from a valuation standpoint, they're not as astronomical as they were in 2000. That was truly the bubble of all bubbles. But you can make a pretty strong argument that they're, they're, they're lofty. Well, there's a couple of things that, that strike me about this. You know, one, had you invested your money, obviously, at the peak in March of 2000, it would have taken 15 years to to get back to even. The lesson from that is, as an investor, you are not guaranteed a return. So depending upon the period of time that you're investing in, whatever the, the whatever the investment, there, there's no guarantee. Because I think some people may approach investing saying, hey, you know, if, I, if I'm investing over a long enough period of time, I'm guaranteed a return. That's not always the case. It's not, not the case. You know, no one has a God-given right to positive returns. That's not how it works. You know, 15 years when you look in the rearview mirror, you know, we, we have a recency bias where that doesn't seem like a lot of time. Let me tell you, if you invested in March of 2000 after five years, you you know, that is an eternity watching your principal erode. So uh, I think the other takeaway that, you know, a lot of that return obviously has come since 2009, March of 09. So, you know, we've had a six year run like almost no other run our country has seen. And I think it would be a pretty big mistake to extrapolate the last six years into the next six years. Yeah, without question. But I do wonder if if where we're at now is a positive for investor psychology, because if you go back 2000 to 2002, the Nasdaq lost almost 80 percent of its value. So obviously that put a, a big dent in investor confidence. And we had the financial crisis now we're back up to those levels from 2000. So you wonder what the mindset's going to be for investors, because we know over these past six or seven years, as the market has, has made this climb, uh, it really has been a, a very unloved rally, uh, if not one of the most unloved that we've ever seen. And uh, it's been this wall of worry the whole way up. So now that you have some of these positive headlines out there, NASDAQ eclipsing uh, its previous high, I just wonder what that does for investor psychology, if that's a positive or a negative. Well, it, it, well, it's both. It, it's Over the last few years, there have been numerous studies that have pointed out that the investor returns have been significantly less than the market returns. So we know there's some people still on the sidelines or attempting to market time, and it hasn't worked out. But I will say from a sentiment standpoint, recently a report was released about margin debt. And what margin debt is is when you borrow money – to buy things in the stock market. You know, so that is when you are uber bullish and you expect future returns to keep continuing. That's really an, it's a, it's a sign of positive inve- in, investor sentiment and that you're willing to lever up, leverage being debt to buy things you think will increase faster than the rate of the interest you're paying. So now whether that's an inflection point and all the people are wrong, we will be willing to be seen. But clearly that points to the fact that people, or at least investors who have that capability to margin, have a margin loan or, or feel positive about You know, you mentioned valuations, and of course, we can't have a market update without talking about the Federal Reserve. And I I think this is where we get back to the Fed, because there are a number of investors who believe we're back at these levels simply because of of Fed stimulus, that valuations are still in question, maybe not as much as they were back in 2000, but but still in question. There still is concern out there. Uh, And speaking of the Fed, they're actually meeting this week. Uh, Their policy statement is due out on Wednesday. It's going to be very interesting to see if there's anything new here, because investors, of course, are watching for any indication on the timing of the, of the first interest rate hike. And 
uh, you wonder as the Fed continues to unwind stimulus and then moves into uh, a situation where they're raising interest rates, what impact that may have on valuations. Well, it's important to remember that valuation in and of itself is not a particularly good tactical market timing tool. You know, the difference between a potentially overvalued market that drops like a rock and a potentially overvalued market that keeps going up, the difference is investor sentiment. It's what people think. And that's what makes it so hard to tactically try to time the market in that you're judging what other people think. Well, you know, I can't figure out what I think sometimes, let alone figure out the wisdom of crowds. So when the when the as the or as the the Fed releases its minutes, you know, the language will be parsed down to the comma and the semicolon. Is it dovish? Is it hawkish? And how will people react to that? And that's really going to be that's the driving force behind what the market does. Well, and of course, uh, if and when the Fed raises interest rates, this gets back into our currency discussion that we were having earlier because. The, the, this rise in interest rates can continue to make the U.S. dollar more attractive uh, relative to other currencies. So the impact there, are we going to continue to see the dollar move forward? Of course, the move that we've seen is in anticipation of that. So that's going to be, again, another theme to watch. Let's take a break. And uh, when we come back, we're actually going to spotlight a currency hedged ETF. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapist, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at MyMassageBliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget-friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without giving up dependability, let us be your personal shipping assistant. Call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com.
Welcome back to the ETS Store Show. Nate and Jason live in studio today. Don't forget that each month on the show, we select one question sent in by a listener, and we answer it live on the air. We'll actually be doing this uh, in two weeks on the show, and you can send us questions on anything investing or ETF-related. Just go to ETFstore.com and click on the Ask the Host button, or you can send us questions through Twitter. If we select your question, not only will it be featured on the show, you'll also receive a $50 gift card of your choice of either Bella Napoli, the Italian restaurant down in Brookside, or Starbucks. Uh, So be sure to send us in your questions. Now it's time for our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the iShares Currency Hedge MSCI EFA ETF. The ticker on that is H-E-F-A. Of course, we talked quite a bit about currencies and currency hedging with BlackRock's Heidi Richardson earlier in the show. Uh, And this ETF is an excellent option if you want to invest broadly in developed international stocks, but you don't want to be negatively impacted by a rise in the U.S. dollar. Now, when you hear EFA or E-A-F-E, that stands for Europe, Australasia, and the Far East. So, So really all of Europe, Japan, and Australia, and then add in Hong Kong and Singapore. These are established, developed economies. There are 21 developed markets altogether, and this index provides exposure to roughly 920 stocks uh, within these markets. Now, interestingly, this currency hedged ETF holds another ETF, the iShares MSCI EFA ETF, ticker EFA. That's how it gets exposure to these stocks. But, of course, the difference here is that the currency risk is being hedged. And this ETF does so by shorting forward currency contracts. The three biggest currency shorts are the euro, yen, and British pound. And to give you an idea on how the performances compare between the hedged and unhedged version, over the past year, the hedged version, version, so ticker HEFA, it's returned about 20%, while the unhedged version, ticker EFA, has only returned about 3%. That's a big difference between two ETFs holding the exact same stocks. Now, obviously, most of that is because of the strength of the U.S. dollar. But, Jason, the trick here is that this can work both ways. Well, it can. But I think we got to back up just a moment before we put the decide whether we hedge or don't hedge. Do we need international diversification? And I think our guest in the first segment made a compelling case. You, you know, from a valuation standpoint, there's certainly some bargains to be had from a diversification standpoint. And she also mentioned the home bias that we all have, that we tend to invest more so in the country that we're in, perhaps to our detriment. So I think at some level, many and many investors ought to consider are a portion of their investments internationally. Well, one quick note on the home bias. You know, if you look at the U.S.'s percentage of the world's GDP, you know, you could make the case that your portfolio on the equity side should be almost half international exposure. Now, maybe you don't want to do that, but to your point on the home bias, a lot of times when we look at investor portfolios, the percentage of international stocks uh, is much, much smaller than that. So just to your point on home bias. Very much so, as we evaluate portfolios, many of them are, are heavy, heavy U.S. centric. And there's some advantage to that. We all live in this well, country. And, and that's worked out very well here over the past you know, five or six years. But if we look at how the year has begun here, uh, a different story. And, and over the long run, we know how this plays out. Absolutely. So you know, once we've decided that we need international exposure, then the question is, do we hedge? And most investors may not be aware that most, if not all, well, I would say most mutual funds do not hedge. And so investors over the years, their experience in international investing has been the unhedged flavor. And to your point, this can go both ways. Um, if the dollar increases in strength and you want local currency exposure, then hedging makes sense. If the dollar were to weaken, there's potentially some foreign currency moves that would have added to your profit that you're giving up. So there, there is, it's, it's, uh, it's a zero-sum game over the long haul, but in the short term, it can make a big, big difference. But guessing on currency moves is a, is a tall order because, boy, there's a lot of moving parts there. Well, and I, I want to be clear on, on how these currencies can impact the, the local stocks. And, and obviously, we talked about this with Heidi, but You know, if you think about, let's say, a company over in the euro area who exports, and if the euro is cheaper, that makes their goods cheaper to foreign investors. So theoretically, because that currency has come down in value, 
Now their prices are cheaper and they can sell more goods. That's one of the impact, the, 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 the positive impacts that you get from the lower currency. You're right. From an import-export, it absolutely makes a difference. From the, I think our guest also made another point that as interest rates in the United States are normalized, that will also have a big impact on currencies and whether you hedge or not. You know, it's The things going on around the world today are very, very interesting. Most people wouldn't understand or even conceive the fact that a third to a half of all sovereign bonds in the Eurozone are negative yielding out three, four, five years. I can't imagine myself writing a check to our government for the privilege of giving them my money, paying them interest. That's what negative interest is. Jason, just the fact that we're having this discussion on the air here on this radio show, you know, we're, we're well aware that currencies aren't necessarily the most entertaining topic. But, you know, go back, as I, as I said at the top of the hour, uh, you, you look over the past five years or, or 10 years ago, currencies we're never in the discussion. You know, think about your own situation uh, if you're managing your own investments. When was the last time you really thought or looked looked at currencies? If you're using a financial advisor, when's the last time that they talked to you about currencies? This is something that has now moved to the forefront where you have to pay attention to as an investor. It's just amazing. It is. You know, they say the hardest thing to do is to spot a bubble because you're inside it. And, you know, it, it is, it's patently absurd that the cost of money is virtually zero. I mean, that's what interest is. When interest rates, that means you can have about as much as you want, as long as you're credit worthy for almost nothing. And so that that availability will impact rates in that if you're a Swiss citizen or you're in London or you're overseas and you see the 10 year U.S. Treasury paying close to two percent versus a negative yield in my own home country, what are you going to do? Well, you want a treasury. And the first thing you have to do is to trade that yen, that euro in for a dollar. And that creates demand. And that's why the dollar strong. You know, we're spotlighting this iShares Currency Hedge ETF, ticker HEFA. It's amazing because back in the spring of last year, we were looking at the different currency hedge ETFs out there. We were looking at these for our uh, ETF store portfolios. But back at that time, this ETF only had like $2 million invested in it. I I was checking the other day. It now has over $2.5 billion invested in it. That's in a year, really less than a year. Think about that. It's just unbelievable uh, the growth of these products. The, there's, I don't know that there's an area in the ETF space that, have, that has experienced this kind of exponential growth. It, it truly is. The industry itself obviously is, is growing geometrically, not arithmetically. But in this little area of currency hedging, it's, 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 it's interesting. These tools have allowed the individual investor to take advantage, frankly, of institutional type strategies and and planners and investors vote with their dollars and they put their dollars where they think they have the best chance of success. And it just goes to show you how important and how interesting this area is when you see, you know, two million is not on the radar screen in this industry. Billions, that's on the radar screen. In less than a year. Yeah, less than a year. I mean, that is a massive flow. But to your point, this is another tool in the toolbox. We always talk about this, especially during these ETF spotlight segments when we look at the different products out there. And to to your point, Jason, as an investor uh, five or ten years ago, the the thought of of having a currency hedge strategy, uh, really that would have been reserved for for wealthy, sophisticated, institutional investors. But now uh, any investor can have a currency hedged product like this. So if you want to invest internationally and you don't want that currency exposure, you have that now. Uh, That's, to me, what ETFs have brought to the marketplace. Whether we're talking about currency hedged ETFs, whether we're talking about uh, you know, gold. We talked about gold a few weeks ago on the show. Uh, there's all types of, of different products out there that you can now use in your portfolio to, to hopefully drive better risk-adjusted returns over the long run. Uh, that's innovation. It is innovation. We've we, the the theme of currency has been has been you know repeated many times over the last year or so on our show, and we've received a lot of questions because it's a heady topic and it's something that many investors, even experienced investors, haven't had a lot of experience in, and they have a lot of questions. If there's any way we can help, feel free to reach out. If whether it's a little question or a portfolio related question, Nate, you're at Nate at ETFstore.com. I'm at Jason at ETFstore.com, and we're more than happy to help out if you've got some questions about your portfolio, particularly related to hedging. No, I'm glad you. Mention that. Of course, you can always call us at 877 365 ETFs. That's 877 365 3837. You can also visit us online at, at ETFstore.com. Well, in any event, we'll have to leave it there. That is all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank Heidi Richardson from BlackRock for joining us this morning. And don't forget that you can listen to any of our guest interviews by visiting the ETF Expert Corner 
at ETFstore.com. This is a great way to listen to any of the guests that join us each and every week on the show. Again, that's the ETF Expert Corner at ETFstore.com. Uh, also, check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Thanks again for joining us this morning, and be sure to tune in next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Bryce Doty, Senior Portfolio Manager at SIT Fixed Income Advisors, will be spotlighting a very interesting ETF, the SIT Rising Rate ETF, which looks to profit from rising interest rates. And, of course, the Fed is meeting on Wednesday, so the outcome of that meeting uh, will be very interesting as it relates to this particular ETF. Again, that's next Tuesday at 9 a.m. Until then... Have a great week, everyone.